Welcome to Throughout All Ages 1530 Apologetics, where the conversation always gives you a foundation that is built on biblical principles, so you can intellectually and critically learn to weigh out decisions about life with truth, facts, contradictions, and the reality we live in, and history. Host Joe Gaona covers topics like apologetics, worldviews, contemporary culture, and the Word of God to help you articulate a defense for how you live your Christian life. See how you can get involved in support Throughout All Ages 1530 Apologetics by visiting ThroughoutAllAgesMinistries.com That's ThroughoutAllAgesMinistries.com Joe, where is that magnifying glass? How you doing today? This is Joe with Throughout All Ages 1530 Apologetics. And we're here for our discussion today, and we're going to talk about morality. Does morality change with the culture? And if not, why not? Right? That's the question. And does Christianity have a justifiable answer for this? And where does this objective standard come from for morality? And where do we get a standard for right and wrong? Before we have this discussion, I want to bring up two points that seem to always come up when we discuss morality, especially on college campuses. Did religion bring moral laws to hold down the people, to hold down the masses? In other words, we hear about the powers to be made up religion with certain values of morality to hold down the masses, to keep them in check. That heaven and hell were brought in to keep people scared and dependent on powered, hungry men. Well, as we look at the world around us, this is something we do with 1530 apologetics. We want to weigh the evidence, the history, the science, philosophy, and the reality that we live in. And does it make sense as we weigh out what we believe in our worldview what we're actually standing on, the firm foundation. Does it make sense, our worldview? When we talk about morality, we look around us. Many of the students, many people look around and we see morality changing not only with the culture, but we see it changing within the church. So does morality change with the culture? And if not, why not? When we talk about did uh, morality or religion come in to hold down the masses, um, we need to ask a couple questions. In other words, when we look around us, every worldview, whether it's atheism, Buddhism, Christianity, liberalism, or conservatism, can be used to hold down the people. We've seen this in history You see, you take a few good men who project to start off to do something good, and then over time they become greedy, and we're seeing this happen everywhere. And as they get greedy, they begin to take over the masses. Christianity, we have a justifiable answer for that. And you should too. The Bible tells us not to get caught up with false persuasions, right? It tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.21 to test everything and to hold fast to what is good. Now, when we look at that word to hold fast, to hold sternly on what is good, that word good, in other words, we look for that which is true, honorable, and genuine. The distinction is between that which is good fruit and that which is corrupt fruit. You see, even if an eloquent man were to make a speech, an emotional plea that would stir you up inside, that causes your hair to stand, and within you, you are thinking, man, this was just an awesome speech or an awesome lecture that this gentleman gave, we're still to test the words with our principles, with truth. And facts. And as we look at morality, we need to remember not to lose sight of what they always say to the Christian. When they talk to you, they are, they are always saying, uh, uh, you talk about morality. This is my second point. 
The first point was is that anybody could bring rules and regulations and to hold down the masses. We've seen that in every worldview. But then there's this question of who are you as Christians to talk about morality? You guys are hypocrites. Look at the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisitions. Now, if we are asked about this topic, I I would admit it. I would admit that there were a lot of deaths, a lot of murders, a lot of bad motives were done during this 200 years of history and of the Crusades. It was called the Dark Ages. It's a term often used synonymously with Middle Ages. It refers to a period of time from the, the fall of the Roman Empire and the beginning of renaissance, the beginning of discovery. We need to understand, first of all, this, that it wasn't just us going out full board and having these crusades. It was the Islamic invasion for territory that was launched way back in 630 A.D. Remember, about 600 A.D. or so, it's when Muhammad got his vision and began to write the Quran what well, was during that time that they began to now invade territory, to take over territory. And as they begin to take more and more territory, we see the Byzantine Empire had fallen to them, Jerusalem, and a huge part of Christendom in that area. So about 400 years later, they launched the first crusade. So there were nine crusades. It was the first one that was launched in 1096 AD and Pope Urban's call to help the fellow Eastern Christians against the Muslims. And so we see this as the first crusade. Now in this 200 years of history from 1096, when the first crusade started to the ninth one at 1272 AD, it is estimated. And again, we're using high numbers here is estimated that Three to five million people were murdered during these 200 years of history. Um, We need to look at our history as America. We've been here for almost 300 years. So the Crusades lasted 200 years. And then you have the Spanish Inquisitions that maybe up to 3,000 to 30,000 people died or were murdered during the Inquisitions. And that, that lasted 350 years. So it wasn't just 200 years. You're talking about 350 years gone by. So if we add up the Crusades and the Spanish Inquisitions, that's about 550 years of history with maybe three to five to six million people that were murdered uh, from these Crusades and the Inquisitions. But when we think of this, as we begin to weigh it out, right, this is what we need to do. We need to weigh it out with truth and we lead to, and we need to look at history. And when we look at the atheist dictators that ruled the world and we compare it, we can look at the 20th century, just 100 years ago, Joseph Stalin, an atheist dictator, 42 million people were murdered. Mao Zedong, 37 million people. Adolf Hitler, 20 million people. Chiang Kai-shek, 10 million people. Valdemar Lenin, 4 million people. And Pol Pot, 2 million people were murdered. So there was more shed in the 20th century by atheistic dictators than the last previous 19 centuries put together. So we need to weigh it out. That is our answer when they come to us about Why so much killings with the crusade? Well, when we average it out with the atheistic dictators, it wasn't about religion. Uh, When we talk about science and evolution, they say that mankind came from a common descent, from a single ancestry on earth by undirected mutations and natural selection. Now, Richard Dawkins, a famous atheist, refers to this as we come from selfish genes, blind physical force, no design, no purpose, and no reason. So you need to think about that when you're standing on this worldview of um, atheism or of naturalism. Now, when we think about science, science cannot prescribe moral values of right or wrong. 
And it gets into a problem when it starts moving from what is to what ought to be. It's here the naturalist, the atheist world view is clashing with contradictions because there is no teleological or no telescope for unguided mutations and natural selection. Science and evolution can explain the origin of right and wrong. Science can tell us how things work, but it can never tell us how we ought to behave. It can only account for pre-programmed behavior, but not moral choices. Moral choices, think about this, moral choices by their nature are made by free agents. These moral choices are not determined by uh, internal uh, mechanics or uh, mechanical antecedents. Morality dictates what future behavior ought to be. When we say you should tell the truth or you shouldn't rape and murder, this is a standard given that science cannot determine. Darwinism can only attempt to describe why humans acted in a certain way in the past, not if it was wrong or right. So the difference between morality compared to well-being, like Sam Harris would say, or the difference between a standard and a standard of good and utilitarianism, well, we're going to talk about that, that the compare between morality and well-being, and we're going to see that there is subjectivism when we talk about the naturalist in real life scenarios. This is Joe. I hope you'll be a part of the second part as we talk about morality. Does morality change with the culture? If not, do we have a justifiable answer? This is Joe with 1530 Apologetics. Don't go away because there is much more to come with Throughout All Ages 1530 Apologetics. Seven out of ten students growing up in a Christian home, they actually walk away from their faith. There are going to be 20 or 30 questions that you're going to have to ask yourself that determines who you are. Whether you're going to be a Christian, an atheist, a skeptic, an agnostic, a Buddhist, a Muslim. Welcome back to Throughout All Ages 1530 Apologetics. And now, here's your host, Joe Gaona on K Praise. How you doing? This is the second part of 1530 Apologetics, and we're talking about morality. Does it change with the culture? Now we're looking at what Sam Harris would say, well-being, and we're always hearing this compared to morality. But in my opinion, this is a huge difference when we're talking the difference between the standard of good and utilitarianism. When we see this, we need to see that I can give you a few examples here. With utilitarianism, it says, if you are a transgender woman, you should be able to compete in a woman's sport. Why? This makes them happy. This gives them a sense of not being different. But morality says, no, there is a difference between biolog a biological male and a female. And to have transgender women race against biological women in a competition is wrong. When we look at well-being or utilitarianism, says even though your fetus, a baby, which is a human being, is alive, breathing, replicates, has growth, stimula, and metabolism, that if murdering it, murdering the, the child, the fetus, will make you happier, then this is the greater good in the society. But morality says no, just because a human being is weaker, because of the stage of growth doesn't mean a child has less dignity or value. There is a difference between morality compared to well-being. I want to define morality. Morality says in the dictionary is the principles concerning the distinction between right and wrong or good and bad behavior. 
But what is strange about this definition that once you start calling something bad or evil or not good, there must be a standard of good. And how do you know what that standard of good is? In other words, if I tell you that they found aliens up in Mars the other day and it was in the newspaper or it was on the web telling you they found aliens and I said, hey, is that the same type of aliens that are that they found in 1968? And you would look at me and you would say, well, how would I know? How could I know if it was the same type of aliens? Unless you actually went over there and saw those aliens and saw what they looked like, then you would have a description. You would have something to look at to know whether it looked like those aliens in Mars looked like the ones compared to 1960. So unless there is a standard to look at, how could we possibly know? Therefore, this is the same for moral values. When we look at morality, you have to say, if you say something is bad, you must have a standard for goodness. And this is what C.S. Lewis was talking about. How would you ever know a stick was crooked and first, if in first you never saw or until you saw what a straight stick looked like, you would never know that it was a bent stick. And so it is with morality. You know, Jeffrey Dahmer is an infamous serial killer, an atheist that was sentenced to 900 years in prison. He brutally killed 17 men and boys, dismembering them, stirring their parts, and indulging in in cannibalism and necrophilia. And this is something that he said. Jeffrey Dahmer says, if a person doesn't think that there is a God to be accountable to, then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges, right? And you know, Dahmer is totally right on this. If we are just chemicals in motion, if we are just animals, then why are we trying to modify some type of behavior to be acceptable? We never do that with any other animal. We don't look at a lion that's in the... um, that's looking at a gazelle in the grasslands and he sees a gazelle and he just decides just because he wants to it something that he wants to do he goes and pounces on a gazelle tears him apart and then leaves him there and walks off we don't look at that lion and we say oh that was a bad lion we got to teach him how to have some dignity, some moral moral values in his life. Let's put him in prison. Let's uh, let's get him to act and redirect his behavior, and then we'll let him back out in the wild. We we never see that happening. No, we actually say this is their life. This is the way they live. The strongest of the fittest survive. Let them do what they want. Certainly, if you're just an animal. Who is going to be able to say what is right and what is a wrong for a standard that we live in? But when we talk about Christianity, with Christianity, it's love with a standard. You see, love without a standard is no love at all. When I, uh, when I knew this girl who was going to get married And she called up her uh, mom and she said, Mom, I only known this guy for six months, but I know we're right for each other and I want to get married to him. We are going to get married. And the mom said, hey, maybe you should take a little more time and figure, make sure things are right. She goes, no, I know this is the right one. Well, they got married and a few months went down the line and she found out that Dan was just going out with all kinds of women. And he, she came to Dan and said, Dan, what's, what are you doing? We're married. Why are you going out with all these women? And you know what Dan told her? Dan said, you know what? Ever since I was born, I was born that way. I love women. I love to interact with them. I love to be a part of them. And who are you to take that away from me? That's just who I am. And you know what? Dan is right. If there is not a standard, if there is no ultimate goal, then who are you to say how he ought to live his life? But we see this with God, that God comes into history. Now think about this. When God comes into history, he comes to a group of people, and he begins to tell them how they ought to live their lives. 
and he begins to give them the civil law and the decalogue and begins to tell them how they ought to live but that wasn't the final point everyone likes to look at the old testament and say hey what's going on there with leviticus that was a starting point as god would begin to reveal to us more and more what morality looks like and we know that one day a man was to come on earth and his man was named jesus christ and he was to fulfill all these laws in commandments and he did this as they hung him on a cross and he rose from the dead he came and fulfilled all those laws with two precepts you remember what those two precepts are the two greatest precepts that jesus said is to love god with all your heart might and soul and to love your neighbor this is what we come down to with the two precepts to love god with all your might and soul and to love your neighbor as yourself now when we talk about love and a standard and morality but how do we justify this how do we justify an answer for morality well you only got three choices you don't got 20 choices you don't got 50 choices in this life as a human being there's only three choices that you have and each one of us are living in this area one is called individuals individualism individualism says this that each person has their own brain you got your brain i got my brain i make my choices you make your choices who are you to judge me on what i'm thinking about inside my brain and who i am and that's called individualism the second choice and i wonder today if you're living in that worldview the second choice is the convention of men now the convention of men says this it's 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 not like individualism which is subjectivism individual uh, convention of men says this let's say freddie gets a group of men together and he says hey murdering babies is wrong they have intrinsic value and we can't murder them and everyone agrees and everyone puts it on the laws and they say great this is our standard of living the convention of men but then a decade goes by and freddie now changes his mind he introduces to them a new value and says babies have no worth and and you should be able to kill them up to nine months you should be able to murder them and even in euthanasia that even when they're born we should be able to murder them and the people go yes we we agree with that that is relativism that's men coming together and changing their mind often but then there's a third way and the third way is called god that transcends me and you as human beings in order to know if something is right or wrong to or in order to know a standard me and you have to go outside of my mind and your mind outside of humankind and this is where god comes and transcends now it's just not any kind of god this god must be all-powerful all-knowing all loving has justice and judges righteously that he can give us a moral standard to live by that doesn't change because of the value of the time or because of culture and this is something that god does he transcends to us so the christian we have an answer for this it's not subjectivism individualism it's not a convention of men but it's someone who's all powerful this christian god that knows all things that gives us a value system and how we live our lives so i want you to think about this and as you lay this out this world view we need to see this it wasn't the euthyphro dilemma it wasn't something that god says well i'm just arbitrarily saying something is good or it wasn't that god was looking at something outside of himself and saying that's a good so i'm going to live by that no we know this goodness comes from god's character it comes from god's nature it is who god is and god tells us because we're made in his image that we're his bear and that we're to bear the image of god in how we live our lives I want you to think about those things and weigh out this truth. This is Joe talking about morality with 1530 Apologetics, and we'll see you next week. You guys have a good weekend.
That's a take, and this has been Throughout All Ages 1530 Apologetics. You can learn more about your host, Joe Gaona, how to support and get involved with 1530 Apologetics by visiting throughoutallagesministries.com. That's throughoutallagesministries.com. 1530 Apologetics is vigorously setting the pace to give easy answers to hard questions in the culture we live in. So be sure to join Joe at this same time next week for more biblical principles to help you intellectually and critically learn to weigh out decisions about life with truth, facts, contradictions, the reality we live in, and history. This has been Throughout All Ages 1530 Apologetics.